and welcome to another episode of Life Talks with I.O. Farrelly. We have the wizard, DJ Nash <laughs> in the corner over there, and we have Skinny Man, What's aka happening? to me, Alex, my yeah. brother. <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Come on, man. <laughs> What's going on? It's all going on. It's all going on. The world's spinning and we're sat still. Yeah. I think your world's spinning even more. <laughs> <laughs> Here's <laughs> <laughs> the glasses. Yes. Oh. Yeah. How did we know each other? Whoa. I don't know. Yeah, we, that slowed you down a bit, we, didn't it? We might have even met in a life before this one. Yeah, no, it's yeah it feels long, that long way. Time, <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? It does, though, innit? it? Yeah. It does. It does feel that way. Back in the day, it was a lot different to what it is now, innit? Mm. Like the values, everything that was going on. A different world. Yeah. A world that the kids of today will never have the privilege to know. They never understand it really as well. They could, they wouldn't fit in. I don't think. So do we fit in today? <laughs> <laughs> Square was it? Square figure around the hole. Yeah, yeah. Don't uh, put the star in the triangle. Yeah, yeah. You're the same though. You ain't changed. Don't put the fork in the plug hole. The Out of all of the wrong things that people could put in all the wrong holes. Yeah. Anyway, next conversation. Hi. <laughs> hey, what was yeah. it like being a youngster? What was it like being a youngster? Yeah. It was exciting. Still, it was it was freedom. It was optimistic. I think um, the magic that you possess as a child yeah. that lets you feel like anything can be accomplished, yeah. and there's nothing that you can't do, yeah. and everything in the world is exciting, and the world is your oyster to explore and find out. Yeah. I think being young was the most magical experience that you can have. I think you're still young at heart. You've got to stay young at heart. Yeah, no, yeah. you've got a bad energy, man. <laughs> you've got to stay young at heart. I'm still the excited teenager. Yeah, 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 yeah I don't yeah. want to lose that energy. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm trying to find out about you as a youth, because you know, everyone knows you, not everyone knows you, but mm. you're very well known. Mm -hmm. And um, you didn't just spring up from the ground. This no. person that is in front of me, I ain't seen you in years. Long time. But you're still the same person. Yeah. You're still like, that energy that comes out, is fucking amazing. Yeah. A few more wrinkles. Ch change is scary. Oh, person. I'm fully grey. I'm the silver fox under this hat yeah, now. Okay, yeah. Wow, well, fully silver fox. Come on. Yeah. At least you got, at least you got a barley ready. Catch the fantastic Mr. Silver Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Strikes again. <laughs> Come on. So, coming up, what was it like? Well, what were you like? Because you're heavy into the hip-hop and stuff, and you've rapped for how Coming up, I was coming you, up yeah. in life, or...? In life, not in life. Coming up in life, I lived in a beautiful bubble um, in my earliest infantry childhood in Leeds. Okay. And um, with a cultural melting pot yeah. that I was engrossed upon, and all of the experiences of... Growing up in the generation of the Rubik's Cube, um, the Atari computer, the ZX Sinclair, um, you know, the first ever home um, entertainment consoles, um, instead of going to the arcade, or before the arcade, should I say, because we know about the arcade, yeah, fair, play arcade days, definitely, definitely, fair Play days, wasting days in Fair Play. So I think that growing up in Leeds, it was all very exciting. Um, I engrossed myself in all different music cultures like mod, rock, punk. I was going to say at, that to you. At yeah, home, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. very Motown nice. and roots rock reggae and revival and um, stuff like that from my mum. And she knew all of the original breaks and beats from any hip hop tune I ever brought home. She'd be like, let me play your original of that. And I'd be like, oh, shizzle. My mum knows it all. <laughs> and um, Wendy, big up Wendy. To show me that there was even a deeper rooted culture in the music that was brand new to me yeah. in hip hop, she'd go, oh, let me show you the break, what they've used to create that song yeah. so I'd be like oh there is a root and a foundation to all of this um, and I think it was the birth of breakdancing so growing up in my infantry stages I saw people with the long mod coats I saw skinheads I saw punk rockers with the big spiky hair and yeah. the nose chains to the ears yeah. and all of this saw lots of skinheads with um, tight jeans Dr. Martins and Dream NF pipes. and NF um, tattoos and stuff yeah, like yeah. that and swore sticker tattoos and I think the cultural melting pot observations was kind of like if you go to Leeds when they're playing football, you can expect to see an NF army because Leeds throughout the early 70s was very much um, a far right wing support team. Area, on the team, yeah. the, the football. <clears throat> so um, it kind of like made me a bit like non turned on towards football because yeah. of the political demograph that I saw that the football brought to the matches yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where I was more comfortable going to Chapel Town in the West Indian Mandela Centre 
and um, going to the um, West Indian churches and making costumes for carnival yeah. and learning how to make a steel pan and beating out the steel pan, playing Yellowbird and, yeah. and, and stuff like that. So it was a beautiful experience. Um, it was a generation where BMXing came out. Yeah. You know, we went from um, choppers and budgies and tomahawks and then we had the grifters and the boxers. Taking it all the way back uh, out, uh, man. And then, and then E.T. came out. Uh, yeah. Elliot Ouch, um, yeah. phone home. Phone first, yeah, yeah, first yeah, time yeah, you yeah. ever, First time we ever witnessed a mobile phone. Because what he did was he took a speak and spell as the board. Mm -hmm. He took a bin lid yeah. as the receiver. Yeah. And he phoned home. But that was oh, the first ever mobile <laughs> home we ever saw. So like, I never even thought it, about that, you If know? you think about the first ever mobile phone you ever witnessed, it was E.T. phoning home with Elliot. For fuck's Ouch. sake. Um, but that's when we first saw BMXs and was yeah. like, oh, shizzle, what's this? And yeah, we yeah. Um, then had our rally burner phase, yeah. BMX burner. burner. I, I, I was a half pint, so I was on a mini mag burner yeah. that got stole when I came to London. Yeah. So of course you, you yeah, came to London, mate. Like, <laughs> you could leave your bike yeah, outside the shops. <laughs> <laughs> you got to shop in London, yeah, yeah, mate. Back, gone. So, um... Then it was all to do with whatever my mom was thinking in her mind, opportunity for the kids or wanting to find new pastures, uh, whatever her decision was, where children and mum's the executive in charge of the family unit. Mm. So she's decided, grab a bag full of what you can fit in a bag. We're off to London. Yeah. Um, I know for my sister, she was a teenager, yeah. didn't want to lose the environment that she was in with the friends she was comfortable to have to start anew. Me, I was like, seemed kind of exciting. Can I bring my bike? <laughs> and that was, you lost that your was bike. The, yeah, and I lost my bike. <laughs> but that was the deal breaker for me. So I could say coming to London, the things that we was into, myself and my sister, and my brother would have been just born, so he was a baby at the time. Mm. How old was you at the time when you came to London? I would have been nine going on ten. Okay, um, in Leeds Academic, you go from being in primary school to middle school. Mm. So I would have been going into the second year of middle school. And I come to London and they told me no, I was a third year of primary school and it was a bit oh, demeaning. No, and the educational <laughs> system showed me that London was actually three years at least behind Leeds' education system because we had already been practicing learning a second language for two years. Yeah. When I asked them in the London education system, which went from... It's when the start of Ilya in a London education yeah, yeah, yeah. and I asked them, Ross, you're the, just bringing things when back the, out, when did they start speaking French? And they was like, oh, not until you get to secondary school in the first year. Mm. And I was a third year in primary. So it messed me up. I was like, when they did my reading, I was above my age. When they did my maths, I was a bit above my age, mm. you know, second language already. And I kind of felt like we was developed in Leeds education from having primary school, middle school, high school. Mm. We was like three years ahead academically. Mm in our learning so it kind of let me say well i could sit around and mess about for three years then before i need to <laughs> catch up to anyone um which left me saying london exciting on the on the first day as we was arriving to london in the it's like a pickup truck with a bed carriage but a bed cabin above the yeah. guy who's delivering your stuff yeah so me and my sister was in the bed cabin above and there's so a the delivery, the removal truck. Yeah, the, the removal truck with the bed cabin above. So me and my sister's in the bed cabin. She's on one side, I'm on the other side. And she's going to me, come here and look at the size of Top Shop. So I'm flying over to her <laughs> side and seeing Top Shop, some big, massive, <laughs> like gigantic high rise building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm going, look at Olympus Sports. <laughs> oh my God, Olympus Sports, <laughs> Lily Whites. So it must've been driving down the main strip. And for us, it was yeah. like, everything was um, new magnified by 10 times all of yeah. the stuff that we liked and i'm seeing like um graffiti on the walls and break dancers on the corner yeah. and i'm like we've arrived it's here it's yeah. all here everything that i wish to immerse myself in culturally now that hip-hop has just been birthed i mean mm. we've moved to the big capital city yeah. and i'm so excited to be a little fish in the biggest pond that you could imagine to be in what was your first um introduction to hip-hop the first what for you what do you remember the first time i like, say yeah. See, this is it. I mean, people were rapping long before it was ever termed, phrased and coined as the as the hip hop. Um, so for me, in my upbringing, I saw people being lyrical and waxing lyrical, whether it was on blues music, whether mm. it was on reggae music, mm. whether it was on... Cockney rhyming slang around the piano. So for You're me, talking Chaz and Dave and certain other people, and I'm talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, what yeah, was yeah. Chaz and Dave's route yeah. to being Cockney rhyming slang, who were their forefathers. So for me, I think if you ask me about hip hop, mm. I look towards like 
1920s Cockney pubs. Nice. When when they were doing Cockney rhyming slang songs around pianos in the public house. Mm. For me, I would say that's the epitome of like the birth of what I know to be hip hop. Okay. And I'm sure that even in the southern states in America, the blues artists were rapping. Mm. There's um, footage being brought up now of um, somebody doing the Moses song where he was rapping all of the bars and that's from like the 40s, the 50s. What's the Moses song? It was a rap that he did that was kind of like um, biblically inspired about okay. Moses. Okay. Um, and with his little doo-wop guys in the back and yeah, he was kicking yeah. it lyrical. And I'm, So I'm seeing my observations from rock and roll, from punk rock, from people like Bob Dylan and from other people that I recognise as rapping. Yeah. Being engrossed in the infantry stages of dance hall and sound system yeah, from, was, my, from my yeah, mum yeah, and stuff like bit. that. I saw the first time that they wanted a master of ceremony who's the guy on the mic who keeps you bubbling and entertained. He would normally say, Brenda, your mum's outside and you've got to come home and whoever's driving the Ford, whoever's driving the Ford, Capri outside, you better move it because you're blocking the entrance and who's in the Triumph DR7 yellow because yeah, you got to, yeah. you know, and I was used to the master of ceremony doing that. And then um, what you had was you had people that would let the dub section of the reggae rhythm bubble mm. whilst they would give a little ride it. toasting and chanting over the mic, riding yeah. the rhythm and bringing a little fashion and style to it. Yeah. I know at the time in America, there was people like DJ Hollywood who would host and entertain the crowd with, with little rhymes. Yeah, um, DJ Hollywood, um, before any hip hop DJ, but he would entertain the crowds with his little banter in between songs. Yeah. And then in Jamaica, they only knew the sound system after the Second World War when BBC equipment was left behind. So they yeah. were, yeah. So You're just they, dropping bombs of, so of, they was of, able, of, of yeah, history so, information. So they were able to then <laughs> ele elevate into the sound system, yeah. you know, get the tweeter, the sound, the phonics, the equalizers, build a bass bin, yeah. and, and then start competition in sounds who could play the best sounds. All of these reggae um, dubs coming out on acetate plate, on the other side you had the instrumental. So they started saying, let's emulate and toast and chant yeah. over these ry rhythms and to me that's the root core of the birth of hip-hop rapping because mm -hmm. there was people like iroy and uroy um iroy and uroy um they used to like bust their little raps in between the dub section of the mm -hmm. reggae rhythms so they'd take a famous song and put their little personal twist on it um, yeah. Something that I think Ghostface does brilliantly today. Ghostface Killer? Yeah, Ghostface Killer. He takes old soul songs and he'll just rap right over them like without even taking the bits out. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like he's doing today what you were, was doing in the late 50s and 60s okay. um, throughout the 70s. And so for me, I saw the birth of rap that way. I saw people come after um, the Iroys and the Uroys, um, like your yeah, Professor Nuts yeah. and people like that. And I just saw what was going on in America. They was trying to emulate the vibe that was going on in Jamaica, but okay. they don't speak Patois. Yeah, yeah, they have yeah. their own dialect and their own style of how they do things. That's it's, interesting, it's you a, know. It's a New York thing. So yeah, where, it's New York. Yeah, yeah. So Jamaica's they, in New York as well, wouldn't so, it? So where they was trying to emulate what was going back home in Jamaica yeah. in the New York sound systems was the birth of the MC. They needed somebody American to emulate how to keep the crowd entertained yeah. like the Jamaican MC does back in Jamaica yeah. amongst the sound systems. So this was the birth of the MC hosting for the DJ. Yeah. And you would know at the time, all throughout the infantry stages of hip hop, it was always the DJ who was the front name and the MC was the guy at the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, Eric B and Ra Kim. Kim yeah, it yeah, was yeah. DJ Cash Money and Mike Marvelous. It was Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Uh, you know, um, the MC hadn't quite really earned the front place. Yeah, 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 yeah it was yeah. all about the DJ and the MCs who would MC for him. If we look at what we had going on in England at the time of my youth and one of the first records I ever bought was Smiley Culture. Oh, wait, I was waiting for you to talk about my man. You know? Yeah, come on. Um, um, police officer, don't bother give me a producer. Yeah, that uh, one, didn't And it? all of them <laughs> ones. So, um, Saxon Sound and yeah. Coxon Sound and um, Fat Man Sound System. No, all them very well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you know uh, what? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Fat Man Sound System <laughs> and King Tubby's yeah, and yeah. all of the foundation sounds yeah. that set up their rigs and brought music to the community. Yeah. Um, 
we fully have to appreciate them because they're that's I appreciate them for making me who I am. Yeah. So I give credit to the forefathers for everything that they've done before me. And um, I'd say that England at the time started to create a grassroots style of its own. Mm. It's to do with the Windrush generation coming here after the Second World War, um, bringing exciting fashion, style, mm. trend and culture and being so influential on British culture with everything that they were doing, you know, that they brought the ska music, the two-tone music, mm. the reggae music. And I think by the time the reggae explosion happened in my childhood, um, watching it then transgress into dancehall culture mm. and um, the fashions that we would see from Jamaica coming to England and the influences that they were having on the British community. Yeah. Um, it was all about them when we were young. It was really. brilliant. And um, ripped jeans and certain jackets. So and... I'm seeing then someone like Papa Sam mm. rapping incredibly fast. And the, f the first people we saw to rap fast was from Saxon. And I have to give credit to Papa Levi, mm. who I don't know if enough people give him the credit, but Papa for me. Papa Levi. Yeah, Papa Levi was the first person to ever, for me, to ever witness doing double time spitting. Mm. And I think he set the trend of what emerged a whole generation of rapping fast. Yeah. And he's double time spitting. When you say double time spitting, you, I understand rapping fast, maybe like Twister Ward, but when you say double time spitting... I so it got uh, that, for example, um, I'm slim, I'm trim, the rubbish in a bin, in my ring is a diamond and ting. Slim and the trim and the rider with him, in the ring is a diamond and ting. Okay, Fasting okay, 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 yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like doing yeah, yeah. it double time. Yeah. And um, I think he was the first to ever really bring that style to the forefront. And from that, you saw many people take that style and elevate it and yeah. be inspired by that style and make their own version of it. Today, I would say the General Levy's, you know, the Shabadees, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tongue Twister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very influenced by it all. Mate, myself. I was going to say about you, because I remember you taking them out when we were younger and that was, that was what was coming out of your mouth. Yeah, like you look one way, and then what's coming out your mouth is the just fast talk. Yeah, and um, it's just on point so as well. At the same time, I had to mirror that with what I was seeing going on with Chaz and Dave. Okay, Chaz and Dave was doing the rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Papa <laughs> Sands doing the peanut, and I'm peanut, and I'm peanut, yeah, and I'm. Yeah, and yeah. I, 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 do you know is a very, a, a very close parallel to what was going on amongst all of the cultures and how they had emerged. So I was engrossed in this, just blown by it all, yeah. loving the fact that. I'm seeing that there's this style in multifaceted cultures. I'm engrossed in amongst it all. I wasn't willing to label myself or box myself into anything. Mm. So I was free to express myself in anything I wanted to do. Um, so what, 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 your, your energy and your tenacity, have you been like this all the time, Al? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where'd you get it from? Well, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, maybe <laughs> something in the water. Thanks to my mum. Thanks to the... Your mum, I, I really the, like your mum. <laughs> the ancestors. Um, yeah, I love my mum. She's my best friend in the world. She's my hero. Can we just talk about it? <laughs> We're going to talk about mum. Yeah. <clears throat> Growing up as a child, I used to think um, my mum's everyone's mum. Yeah. And I think um, now I'm an adult and I reflect. I think if there was ever a time where I thought, how come she's everyone's mum? I think you might have a teacher in a class. <clears throat> and if the teacher in the class is observing every child in the class, but her very own child is in that class, she would know if her child needed special attention. And she would be able to know if her child didn't need special attention. And if other people in the class actually did need special attention, she would know that best about you because she's your mum. Yeah. So she would recognize that people in the class need more special attention than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I was ever the child in the class thinking, my <laughs> I love the way you fucking talk, mate. My mum's the teacher, why isn't she spending this time on me? Yeah. It's because she knew I was good. Yeah. So in the community, I see my mum as some sort of Florence Nightingale. Yeah. Um, who's the little old Mother Teresa. Mm. Um, my mum's a hero to me and she's a hero to many children who grew up in our community with problems. Mm. And um, I remember, I remember coming to the all about my mum now, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's all right, it's all right. And we have to hail up our heroes whilst they're still alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah, was yeah. for you all day, mum. Yeah. Because what I saw was my mum was a mother to everybody. Yeah. And many of my friends like from that. the community who would find um, sanctuary in mm. my house. Yeah. By being my friend, being invited and then finding sanctuary in my house mm. through my mum and yeah. the care and the love that she has for all. And um, and I can just, oh, 
I can testify to that being one yeah. of them people who came to the house <laughs> and, yeah. and enjoyed that coverage and that safety yeah. when, in certain yeah. things was going yeah. on when I was a youngster as yeah. well. That's how we know each other. I used to beat your house all the time. She used but to sorry, say keep going. She used to say her ethics was I'd rather you be here under my supervision than being out there in danger. Yeah. Where I don't know what you're up to. So every child was welcome to my house. Um yeah. my mum believes in the practitioner of, of herbs and that alone, nothing else. So we was able to um practice herbs. And nothing else, which um, gave us a good foundation. Foundation, um, because not even alcohol was allowed. You know, herbs. Yeah. Um, and and that's it. And um, like I say, I saw my mum give her love as a mother and as a caring person to every child in the yeah. community. I think if at one time I ever thought, where? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what about me, mum? <laughs> I don't know, mum. What about me? She's kind of like, you're good. You run off for weeks on end, and we don't know where you go or yeah. when you're coming back. But you always have fun and you're a nutter. So let me special attention and care for those who need it. I know mm. that there's many um, girls in my community that really gelled and bonded with my mum. We come from a community, as we know, of um, a generation of lost children. Yeah. And broken homes. Yeah. And um, growing up as children, you never really know what your household's like. Until you start to visit other households. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> mate. Definitely, <coughs> mate. And then you can get a demographic of, oh, that household's different in that way. Yeah. I, I'm not judging. I'm not passing judgment. Yeah. But, you know, like... You can you'd find okay, out that I've actually got it good at home that sometimes. Hou that like, household's that, that way. Yeah. That household's that way. Yeah. My household's this way. Yeah. The, you know, everyone learns different. Um, I think for me as a child, I learned that everyone in the class is going to grow up and have babies, just like our parents. <laughs> yeah. So it took that superiority of adulthood away from adults from me. I was mm. like, everybody's the same. We just grow up and get older and have kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know a waste man and a waste gal, and they're going to have a kid. Yeah. And when that kid gets to like teenage years, they're going to say, oh, let's go to your yard. And he's going to be like, no, no, don't worry about coming to my yard. Because <laughs> he knows his mum's a waste man and his dad's a <laughs> you, you know, like... It, it's, a bit, it's sad. It's, it, I think it, we love it. It's sad, we're, right? So we're no. saying we're from broken communities of yeah. broken homes and we're yeah. from the generation of the children of the lost souls. And um, my mum was all too But solidarity as well, though, because I think, like, right now, there's a lot of broken homes, broken things, like you said, like, where we came broken from. Broken people. But we had each other. Yes. If we, we consolidated. We did. We had and each other. And what they're consolidating now on We is, unified. Is, yeah, unified. We unified. It's totally different. And it now. gave it's us nuts. strength. Yeah. yeah, no, it gave us, it gave us, it gave us strength. It gave us a good childhood. It gave us memories. It, it gave us, it just gave us strength. Like you said, yeah, it gave us yeah. strength, man. So looking I back, doing so much fucking looking, shit with you, like 20, look, 30 of us, like we've done a lot. So, yeah, go on. Looking back on all what my mum did, um, she will never stop being my idol. I'll never stop idolizing her. She'll never stop being my hero. Yeah. She'll never stop being my best confidant. Yeah. She'll never stop being my best friend. Yeah. I know that um, we all have our time. Many people are um, burying their children. Yeah, sad. Which we know, this ain't the way it should be. Yeah. So when a parent has to bury their child, that's not the way it should be. No, 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 no. But then we also know that we all have our dear mothers. Some of them might have transcended to the other side, watching over us from the spirit realm. Yeah. Um, but I know that when that time comes for me, I'll be in a place where I'll be like, wow. Are you ready? I'll be reflecting on how good my mum was. Yeah. Everything that I am, I'm merely a shadow of a glimpse of what my mum is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love that album, man. It's just love the that. truth. No, I know. That's I know, a, I no, know you know. Love that. Yeah, no, I love that. 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 Love that. Love that. Hey, um, go on. So, um, with my mum being so free and liberal, I was able to be as wild as I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, but you know what, though? Let me, I can, let me say something to you as well. You had that support bracket and that, um, you had the support bracket with mum, the foundation and everything, the confidence and everything, but you weren't a wanker about it. You let everyone else in as well. You mm. was you was so nice and you still are so nice, but mm. you shared. Yeah. You know, some people, they wouldn't share. Like, your yeah. your personality, your energy is just fucking, mate. Yeah, I, I, I remember, I, they've got loads of stories about you, you know, I, mate. I, I, hear, I hear rappers rapping lyrics about 10 men sharing one bottle, that's them, man. Oh, okay, I've never heard that before. <laughs> uh, on, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Living yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, 10 men sharing one pit of bread and chips, that's us, man. Yeah. That's us, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you see us in a dance and there's 10 <laughs> men sharing 
one bottle. We had the same time, 10 men that shared one pit of bread and chips. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, times were nice, man. Come on. Times were nice. Yeah. Rapping. Rapping. Um, um, let's talk Mud Family rapping. Let's talk, let's... Where, where, where do you want to start? I want to know, because I'm, I'm really trying to pick it out. You're skinny, man. You've got artists underneath you. You've been doing it for a long time. You've got songs out. You've got albums out. You've done live performances. You've, you've, got, you've done a lot of stuff. Graffiti, so much stuff out that I can't even get it all out. But, so where can you start for me? Let me know, because... Rapping for me started, uh, and I mentioned the Rubik's Cube earlier. Yeah. Um, when I was in Leeds and I was little, we used to go to the church and we used to go to the Wednesday Bible practices and we used to go to the Sunday schools and have our orange and Lincoln biscuits. Fucking no Lincoln biscuits. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> official <laughs> official church Sunday school biscuit. Yeah. And, um, and do all that. We used to go Boys Brigade and all that. Mm. Uh, and then a wonderful thing used to happen on a Wednesday in Bellevue Road where the Rastas would beat the drum and me being the inquisitive little kid wanting to know it all. And they would tell me about pre-Adam, pre-Eve and just blow my head Educate with like yeah. different teachings from um, a Rastafarian background and perspective and tell me about books like Maccabee and that weren't allowed in the Bible and how King James devised the Bible and gave me um, an education that most children in the UK aren't privy to. Mm. And this would have been in the, uh, throughout the early 70s, yeah. which kind of molded and shaped the way that I saw things, you know, like whose truth is what truth, what truth is there out there, how can you be sure? Yeah. The only truth that is truth is genuine truth that comes pure from your heart, being divine, um, you know, and aspiring to do good. Like, can you say all that again? Can I say all of that? Yeah. <laughs> The truth, the truth, the truth, the truth, truth, truth stuff. I heard it, but I want to break it down. I got <laughs> whose I, truth. I, I'm saying everybody yeah. has their truth. All right, let me make an example. If you're in the east, the sun rises where you live, and that's your truth. And if I'm in the west, the sun sets where I live, and that's my truth. Okay. We have two different truths, but they're both true to us. Okay, now it makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the way you said truth like three or four times, I said, times, the, I said <laughs> the real truth is yeah. divine truth that comes from your pure heart. You know, divine truth is divine truth. Can't be knocked or altered, flawed on, or faulted. Go on, mate, go yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Skinny Man! <laughs> so, but for rapping, for me, um, they wanted me to be in the Christmas play. Mm. And I was at a very infantry primary school age. Mm. And I was like, but that. <laughs> <laughs> Bun. Did you really say bun that back yeah, then? Was that the word to you? Probably had a different <laughs> word, you know, but like, I am not down with this could play. lie that has been devised <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, Council yeah. of Nicaea by men who don't have girlfriends yeah. um, or children um, telling me that um, the Trinity is man, son and the Holy Ghost, not mm. man, woman and child. Mm. Um, the woman's became a Holy Ghost now. And, and I just thought, no, this whole nativity, yeah, she was born, immaculate conception, of course she was. Said, uh, <laughs> just, just not okay, down for nothing. none of this. Yeah. And the teacher was like, so what would you like to do for the nativity play? And I said, well, the only thing people are buzzing about this year is it, it'd be like saying they want the new Nintendo 5 or what's the Sony PlayStation 5? Oh, what's yeah. the new hype? iPhone 13? 14, I think. 14, <laughs> you know, yeah. trying to keep up with you kids. <laughs> so it'd be like, say we've got the PlayStation 6 yeah. and the iPhone 15, yeah, right? Yeah. That was like the, the Rubik's Cube was that for us in our generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. To get a too. Rubik's Cube for Christmas. Yeah. And then after that, they brought out the Rubik's Cube snake. <laughs> Jeez. Mm -hmm. So what I'm I saying is... I broke, I said, I broke I said to, so many fucking times. I said times. to my teacher, I'd rather do a rap about being a Rubik's Cube and they let me dress myself up in a big cardboard box and paint it as a Rubik's Cube yeah. and come out body popping about I'm the Rubik's Cubics mm. and I wrote my own little bars for that for the Christmas play. Nice. And I was about seven years old. So That was your first rap then? I think my first rap was then. Yeah. And I was inspired, you know, to create music and be lyrical and yeah. dress up as a Rubik's Cube and do the Rubik's Cube do, rap. For do you remember it? Don't, I don't remember. It's just about I'm the Rubik's Cubics and I think I did some mathematics rap around it. Okay. Like. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it kind of from so, there. So from there, I'm just lyrical and I'll be listening to lyrics. I think the people who I'm inspired by musically have always had a message in their music somewhat of revolution or somewhat of a political mm. uprising against mm. the system the agendas the regimes mm. that oppress us and i think that being what you call conscious of what you say 
Mm. Um, I thought, well, I don't want to just say words that have no meaning. Mm. I want my words to be meaningful, something that people can learn from, um, something that hopefully someone can benefit from. So if I'm if I'm ever trying to remember my earliest raps, they were always socially conscious, socially aware. Mm. I was always conscious of what I would be manifesting to put out mm. um, <coughs> and how other people may perceive that even though you can never really know how someone's going to perceive yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, Perception yeah. is a whole different conversation. That's their own truth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, how they see their yeah. own truth and how they perceive that to be. Um, so for me, I, I thought, well, we're going to be rapping, but let me rap about what's my truth then. And I remember at the time being in the first year of school, I had my hat twist up to the side like Teen Wolf. I had some baggy dungarines. I had, <laughs> you keep from I Teen had, Wolf. I had um, the first ever what they call Palladium boots, but we knew them as Zoo boots back in the day. Zoo boots. Zoo boots. Zoo boots. What you lot know as Palladium boots today. Yeah. Um, from the Foreign Legion in France. And we was rocking them boots with our little pin tucks and um, had Beastie Boys, Run DMC and LL Cool J all on a TDK 190. And yeah. you can't tape three albums so I had to choose which songs I wanted from the Run DMC yeah. Beastie Boys and yeah. LL Cool J and I was walking around my little Sony Walkman <laughs> jo the jogging one the big yellow one yeah. thinking I was the coolest kid on the block in Andover Estate by the benches and um, rapping the lyrics I was like so forget Oreos eat Cool J cookies I'm bad and I was like what's an Oreo and then someone explained to me oh biscuit. it's a biscuit yeah. from America yeah. and I was like so <clears throat> If he'd have said to me, um, so forget Jaffa Cake Biscuits, I'm bad. I would have got it more because I know yeah. about Jaffa Cake Biscuits, yeah, not yeah, Oreo yeah. cookies. Yeah. And I realised, started seeing identity. Identity to who I was in the UK as a, as a Leeds kid living in London, heavily engrossed into West Indian culture um, and every other culture. Mm. And... Um, Seeing now, like, I'm wanting to rap, but what is it that I'm going to rap about? Who am I? What do I rap about? Yeah, I'm a kid who rides double-decker red buses. Mm. You know, like, let me rap about that. I'm a kid who goes on the London Underground. I hang around um, Chocadero. Let me rap about that. <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> but if you know about Chocadero you know. days... Because we used to, um, every weekend we'd be down there. We used to congregate there so yeah. we could go on activities. Chocadero, man, you taking me back. Go um, on. Um, so I thought, yeah, my, my lyrics and my raps yeah. have to be conscious. People are listening. I want them to learn from it. I want to be saying something. I want people to benefit from what I'm saying. Mm. And I don't just want to be rapping for rapping's sake. I, I don't really want to be rapping about anything that aspires towards negativity neither. Mm. Um, I want to be positive. I want to aspire towards positivity and carry people on that frequency with me. Even though it's contrary to say that 95% of the demograph of what I was immersed in would have been negativity, like the music, the surroundings, mm. living in a lower working class environment, mm. leading people to have no alternative <coughs> but to look for stuff to do crimes to yeah. to you know and stuff like but that so still, it's still your truth though like you said, yeah yeah you're trying to do good in a bad all, situation yeah, all yeah, negative yeah. Things. there's people who are born some negative and we make it happen yeah bro. yeah yeah so and we, we have to do what we have to do yeah. to get by but apart from that we're not you know what i mean we're not negative we're not evil i, we're I not. think um in my would you would have been i think they call it year seven now in mm. school first year in secondary mm. um i think that's when i kind of saw that it's quite easy to do the negative thing and you have to try harder to do the good thing yeah. and and I thought well I'm not looking to take the easy route yeah. because it's easy to go oh, fuck it or hey, what? Yeah. and just go that route that, that's the easy option yeah. to do the good thing and the yeah. right thing yeah. That's often the harder option it's that the takes best more. Option, that, that, that <laughs> takes more effort. Yeah, yeah. You, you, it's like you got <laughs> but, work for it, innit? But for me, it was my only option. Yeah, yeah. There's no nice. other option. Yeah. Going on stage mm -hmm. the first time when you bust because you've been rapping in the flats for seven. No, you Rubik's Cube rapping yeah. in the flats. School when, assembly. Yeah. yeah I'm coming up, coming up. Back at the two five three bus. <laughs> Back at the two five three bus. Beating the window. <laughs> <laughs> I remember all that. Yeah. But then the first time you got on stage. Yeah. And 
got to spit your lyrics and it's like, what was that like? And where was, what was that? Where was that show? I remember going westward with you a lot. Well, when I first come to London, there was this thing on Capital Radio called the Capital Caper. And you had to kind of go to each underground station to get a stamp mm -hmm. to show that you had done all of the stations mm -hmm. and you had done the whole Capital Caper and there was a prize for doing that. And at each station they had an activity. Mm. And I was there copying my Smiley Culture lyrics. Nice. Trying to do my own little rapping. Yeah. Um, a little shortly after that, I linked up with Michael Johnson from Six Acres Estate, and me and him formed a crew because he was Johnson, brilliant. Michael, um, Michael Johnson, Michael Johnson. I know him, anyone know the name? Yeah, he went on to um, work with Rusty Ranks and be called Dominant Force. And okay. so even when they were in school, they were putting out the best bangers that you've heard out of the UK to date. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll still say <laughs> that with chest. Um, so I bigged them up. But what happened was I've got to this place and they were doing breakdancing competition and they had like a rapper MC host. Mm. Um, I won the breakdance competition, got the t-shirt and the hat, whatever, <laughs> put that in the body, bag. Body pop and breakdancing. Yeah, body pop and I'm breakdancing. Fucking won hell. the t-shirt and the hat and that. And then I've kind of said to the MC, yeah, give me a go. And I think he was like, just call yourself little kid. <laughs> I was like, what? No, I can rap serious. Like, come on, I'm a good rapper. <laughs> and I think he was like, like I said, just call yourself little kid. I forgot to call him out. Well, I'm better than you then. <laughs> I realised what it was all about. Well, I'm better than you any day. Yeah, you just don't want me to show you. You just don't want me to show you up. And I think he was like, oh yeah, I'll burn you. And he's giving the mic. I still have a dearly beloved friendship with that brother. Oh wow. To this day. That's good, you know. And his name was JC001, and he was the fastest rapper. On the, the Guinness time. Book of Records. Oh, wow. Yeah, up until Daddy Freddy took the title. Okay. So, um, homage to him. And like I said, so my first getting on uh. like that was like, let me have a go. No, you can't. Well, I'm better than you. Well, come in and let's battle. Uh. And so it was kind of like all of that. Um, I know he respected my rap skills. And uh, with, like I said, beat him, yeah? yeah. <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> and, and, and we're still friends to this day. I will say that I've always had an unfair advantage on my side is that I was raised in dance hall clashing where these rappers weren't. Yeah. So anytime yeah, yeah, they yeah. want to try and get rappy, I'll just get super catty. Yeah. And it turns different. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I have that unfair <laughs> advantage to my style. Um, but yeah, I'm still great friends with him. And then I think so, right, you had to get on and stuff like that. So me and Michael Johnson started rapping and doing our little cassettes and then I enter competitions like breakdance competitions, dance around the clock. And there'd be like rappers there that mm. was already established, like Wee Papa Girl rappers and stuff like that. And I know them, Wee Papa Girl rappers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, uh, and there was um, a couple of crews from the UK popping off. One of them Could had the, the actor from EastEnders in it. What actor? The black guy? Yeah. The, the son? Paul. He put with a, with a, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, 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 yeah. I remember looking at him going, wow, I want to grow up to be like him uh, as a rapper, not an actor. <laughs> and, uh, and and um, anytime they would let me get a chance, I would get on the mic and try rap. One time there was a competition that Westwood was hosting and we went there and I got into the finals of that. Yeah. Did well enough where everyone was like, yeah, this kid can rap. Bro. And so I've always wanted to do it. Um, I think some of the biggest, the first biggest audiences I had, I had a friend um, called Darren Bafonge from Stone Newton Primary School. Mm. Um, me, him, and Ricochet Kalashnikov were like... Kalashnikov, yeah. Yeah, we're like three friends and um, all grew up in that little Stoke Newton era for a small period of time. Then after I moved to Andover Estate, become a Finnish Park you. Yeah. Um, and Fucking right. Kalashnikov became who he <laughs> came. Spongy became who he came. And Spongy was the first person to realise I wasn't just a Yorkshire boy with a Yorkshire accent that I could rap, break dance, chat mm. on the mic. And... Um, they used to have sound system stuff going on. And I'd be like, let me come. He'd be like, yeah, my dad runs this place. He can. No other kids can't, but me and you can. And I just thought all that was really exciting. So I got to chant and toast on the mic where they couldn't believe it. Yeah. And it was like, yo, next week, we're doing Stoke Newton all day. Mm. Clissold Park all day. Like, yeah, come yeah. do Clissold Park all day. So by the time I was like 10 and 11, mm. I was chatting on the sound systems on Clissold yeah. Park all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suppose I was so overwhelmed by the acceptance and the applause and the reception mm. that it's the biggest buzz I had ever known. Yeah. You know, like the biggest, some people jump out of planes for adrenaline. Some people do all sorts of stuff for whatever their buzz yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, seeing me bust my mic skills at the age of 10, 11, uh, Chris O'Park all day is, and getting praise from everyone. For me, that was everything.
Mm. What do you think of the difference in rap now and rap when you was coming up? I think um, we always get rap to evolve. And hip hop has always pushed the boundaries. Rap has always pushed the boundaries and always wanted to exceed the next person, um, bring a new twist, bring a new style. Um, so I'd say if we're currently talking in the year end of 2022, what we've seen is we've seen from the birth of rapping, it was lyrics in the park, lyrics in the basketball court, to then lyrics in between songs, to then people composing whole songs with rap lyrics structured as a song. Then we've seen every different style of that could be brought to the culture. We've seen the Daisy Age, the gangster rap. We've seen um, the intellectual side. We've seen the revolutionary rappers. We've seen the pro pro black rappers. We've seen we've had a whole variation of everything that's been brought to the table. Um, we've of recent seen that people from the UK who wanted to do rapping back in the day were smothered by Acid House, then became Jungle. So they kind of took their lyrics that way. They evolved their lyricism into what was then House and Garage. And then the youth from the urban, lower working class environments, predominantly East London and Newham and the areas that can say they birthed grime are the same places that can say they birthed True. the Cockney language. Oh, okay. the, the Cockney language comes okay, from yeah. the same place that the <coughs> grime music comes from. Okay. Um, so they were still getting lyrical. To me, I always see it as the black boys weren't allowed into the party, so they created their own genre. Mm. Um, there's a lot of racial snobbery within our raving industry mm. around a certain genre, and people wanted to be going money penny with their machino shirts and not wanting the raggers coming mm. it, i'll call them the raggers yeah. um <laughs> black boys from uh. young uh, from poor working environments and i think that for whatever their reason that they feel inadequate if these boys were to come it's fear. is down to their own um fear. inferiority complex yeah yeah right um what because you can't dance at school or whatever because yeah. i because i'm told i got no worries yeah. so um <laughs> So what I'm saying is, for whatever their inferiority complexes yeah. are, they had racial snobbery towards the black boys coming to the upper class Close house and come. garage rave yeah. circuit. So they started grime uh, with a DIY purpose for themselves, for us, by us. And big up to Wiley, big up to the whole grime movement, because lyrically it brought grime back up to a time when I remember hip hop being youthful and exciting with an energy that was raw. Um, that you could feel the youth <coughs> angst within it. Sorry? That you could feel the youth angst within yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt it in punk rock. I felt it in Bob Marley's reggae. I felt it in Peter Tosh's reggae. Yeah, I feel, Tosh, I feel right? it in certain indie people's music. You know, yeah. I definitely felt it at the birth of hip hop with Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five and Don't Push Me Because I'm Close to the Edge. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. coming up in the hip hop and I was like, man, I'm feeling the same energy from these yeah. kids in this grime right now doing this grime thing and then we've seen grime evolve into the musical phonics of making like hip-hop out of jungly speaks mm. which i will look at people like skrillex as being a baby of that and people like rick ross rapping yeah, on a skrillex it. rhythm where really i'm kind of like that's uk jungle is turned into dubstep grimy kind of thing it's transcended across the universe mm. skrillex is producing for rick ross to rap on this and it's coming from the grime side of the jungle list thing. So I'm seeing the parallels. Yeah. And, um, You're like a history book, you know, mate. But ob observing <laughs> the parallels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because to me, House and Garage is um, soca. Okay. Yeah, and it always has, like, I just can't, it's soca. Yeah. Um, where hip hop to me is reggae. Okay. And that's the, the, the differentiation. Yeah, uh, um, it's evolved. For you, it's just evolved. But yeah, it's still yeah, gonna, yeah. It's still so so uh, <laughs> um, tribal house, funky house. Mm. All of that, to me, it's just soca. Mm. Um, some of the drill trap that we're hearing today, to me, it's still reggae. Mm. Um, and I see the birth and the root, and I see that it's never changed from the formula. What we do have is we have a different sound in electric phonics now. So that by the time it comes round to present day, we've got kids that have created this drill sound of drill rap, which to me sounds like hip hop tempo music made out of junglist, dubstep, grimy sounds, electric mm. phonic sounds. So, the sound right now is very um, 
unique and they're owning the digital music. When I think about musicians in the 70s and some of the reasons why I love some of the music from the 70s generation Instruments. is because I believe that they got to the peak of using their instruments to the finest Quincy Jones producing, Barry White producing mm. with his orchestra yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. how they're all at the peak of their instrumentation. You the when you hear them tracks, I man. believe that the children that are making sound recordings at home now are, are reaching the peak of... <laughs> I thought you were going to say I believe the children of the future, sorry. Uh, they're reaching the peak <laughs> Of, of their electrical sound, of their phonics, yeah. of making this drill rap with the bass line, yeah. with the, you know, and, and so the music's great. I say that if we look lyrically at what's happened, the things that hip hop used to be Represent. very masculine orientated, yeah. very, yeah. very, um, what do they call it? Um, not just, not just masculine but almost like toxic masculinity, almost like wonderful. chauvinistic oh. behavior and, and, and deg degradation to women, etc. Yeah. Other than when we see people like Queen Latifah and strong sisters being mm. strong sisters, um, we saw an agenda of um, violence and materialism mm. and being up in the club and sexuality being an agenda. So today we've got our little Nas X's What's Nas X? What do you mean? Little Nas X. He's a. Uh, is that a rap? Is that somebody? Yeah. He, oh, okay. He's gonna ride till the wheels fall off. Yeah, he's controversial. Uh, um, he's a controversial artist. Well, some could say he's controversial. Some might yeah, say, he's just, you, yeah. you know, he's that, gonna ride till the wheels fall off. Yeah, when? that's what his his song is called. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're gonna have to do some research. Yeah. No, I just. And, and the research is not for the faint-hearted, and it's not for under 18. Do you know but, what? I live in my own bubble as well, Al. Yeah. And I like in my bubble some things I don't even want to know. So. LGBT. Okay. Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, not at all. Yeah. I still live in my bubble, though. So, so I'm <laughs> saying um, that probably would have been frowned upon 30 years ago in rap, but today it's acceptable. So I like how rap it, and hip hop is becoming more liberal in its audience. Okay. Meaning that more people can be um, participants mm. of the culture and bring it to a wider demographic, a wider audience. Mm. Um, so at the same time, within our musical industry and i'm going to talk strongly on this if i may now you can talk go, however you want mate right on go right. go I'm get right, right fucking right in there on, mate go on mate right in there, go on in um some lubricant. If, if we look at the musical industry and what's been brought to our attention is that the elite zionist white jewish owners of the music industry are also the people that own the radio stations mm -hmm and the television stations and dictate what becomes the playlists of the radio stations that they owe that they own so that our children can be corrupted by the music that they listen to and end up in the same pe the prisons for profit that these same people own so there's actually a dangerous agenda against the black community especially here in the UK within institutionalized racism how's our batteries looking Especially, <laughs> especially here with institutionalized racism. I love racism. it. We're good, man. We're um, good. And reason being is, if we look at young black male demograph yeah. in the UK, is as little as half a percent, but they take up more than fifty percent of the prison's population. Here in London, in the UK. Here in the UK. <clears throat> if we look at the fact that black youth in the UK are as little as a half a percent. Mm. It doesn't justify that we have a black on black crime unit called Trident. Mm. Is that black on black crime though? Yeah, it started. It, it started black Trident on black crime, started, but, started, but now it's it, like it's gun crime all that, no? Unjustifiable though. But yeah. you, you see what they were trying to do was scapegoat young black boys. Yeah, they fucked about me a bit. The, they the political yeah, agenda. They fought, yeah, they so, so now, what Sheep we have fridge. here in the UK is we have radio music corporations promoting a certain agenda of music as well as grand theft auto computer games mm. that they'll play on their radio stations to influence a demograph of youth to go out and do things that will end them up in their prisons that are owned by them mm. so it's kind of like if me and you own prisons and by keeping them full is how we profiteer mm. and we're not into human compassion, but we're into the business of profit. But the world's fucked, Noel. So I'm saying there's a danger within the music industry. And what I'd like to point out is that as long as black music 
is being dictated to by white supremacists, by white supremacists mm. and Zionists, mm. then we need an uprising and a rethinking of the whole industry. If we could think back to black music in the 1920s, to black music in 2020, there's been no change. There's no black distributors, there's no black music owners. Black people in the last hundred years mm. are not the owners of their own culture. They're not the owners of their own music and this is what has to change. I'm a white artist who does black music. So I want to see the black music industry be owned by the black people. Mm. It's their industry and for the last hundred years it hasn't been owned. And when I think about what I see. But how do you change something like that? Like, how do you, how do you, because they've got the keys to the gate, they've got the keys to this, they've got the keys to well, that. Well, this is it. How it's, do you change something like that? In today's present day, we're seeing that in the age of information, the gates are opening and people are given the key because the key is knowledge. And knowledge is the key that will open the door to independence mm. and receiving your own wealth. If I can make a couple of references yeah, please do. of what, when I first started music as a child, the ludicrous expense of being able to get into a studio yeah. was beyond unobtainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, where today there's, chil you up. there's children who have their bedroom PC and they're the Mozarts of our generation. They're mm. making beautiful musical compositions and they're having great chart success and it's changing their financial position. Um, and what we have is if we look at people like Kanye West, he's released his new album Donda 2 on Stem Player. Yeah, um, exactly what's stem player it's independent he owns it there's no middlemen um, and then we're talking about Snoop Dogg on the Drink Champs explaining how he's become the owner of Death Row Music yeah, now yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's going to be selling NFTs and stuff like this if we look at like moguls oh, like, that's black owned music he owns his stuff so this is why I'm saying we need a whole generation of yeah. black owned music we can't just give one unique example and be happy that that's a token acceptance but then I've, um, I wouldn't even just say that's a one example because behind the scenes you've got Jay-Z you've got some other some people who have, who have changed what's gone on and now you've got yeah, young black people, people with different demographics can actually see that if they work hard, if they do certain things, they can bypass all these people at the door and the keys if they they put their work in. Well, this is what I want to see. And this is what's happening. We're at the birth of witnessing the first time that the people have been able to have the tools yeah. to do for self without relying upon the industry machines. Yeah. I think when Kanye West was saying to Sway, you don't have the answers, I'm, I'm getting a <laughs> gist, right? that what he was saying is that Adidas have been resourcing their materials for cheap to take it to their warehouse to get it made for cheap. They have experience in how to export their product around the world and get it onto the high street shop shelves for cheap. And with all of that experience that they have and on the colossal size that they're doing it for the price that it's gonna cost them in mass production, we at a grassroots entry level cannot complete with that. So I get what he was saying. And in essence to what I'm saying is that within the music industry, where they have been the owners of the distribution, the radio stations, the television stations, the networks, mm. we are now at a whole new generation for all independent artists around the world because from their bedroom alone, they can directly sell their merchandise, sell their music, stream their music, have their own app, have their own independent internet radio station streaming their music on shuffle and generating all these different revenues of incomes without having to go to what have been the master owners of the music industry for the last hundred years. Mm. So I'm saying today is the day that we get to see the music industry uprise. Today is the day. Today is Rise the day. up that we get to see the music industry rise, the key is knowledge. Mm. And the knowledge is the power. So then, so then we, it's, it's on <clears throat> us as olders, so other people Definitely. to do like what the guy's done with you, with the Maccabee Bibles and all that stuff, and educate the youth. There's, or there's, there's so much as a, um, on us as olders that I hold myself accountable for all of the youth failing within the immediate surroundings that I live and the further de demograph because we hear a lot of elders saying the kids have got no respect. And then I pose the question of what they've done to attain the respect from these children. 
Um, if nice, any, well, I like that. I like that. If anything, say that again, please. Yeah, these elders want to know why their youngers haven't showing them respect to yeah. their elders, but they haven't done anything for their youngers to, to attain the respect mm. that they rightfully mm. wish to receive. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What have you done to deserve that? Mm. Um, so I give thanks to all of the elders who ever guided, steered me, especially at the times when I needed it most. Um, many young boys like myself will say that they grew up in a community fatherless. But when you grow up in a community fatherless, the PE teacher might be a male role model. The butcher in the shop might be a, real, uh, a male role model. Mm. Your barber who cuts your hair might be your Do you remember that, um, male role model. You remember don't... that, um, sorry, Al. Go on. Remember that, um, they used to show the papers on Nag's head. The two twins? The, no, the little, I know the two twins, two black <laughs> fellas. Not them, not them. Because <laughs> <laughs> they sold right. the papers on Nag's head. No, there was a little box. Yeah. It was just in the box. Yeah. <laughs> It was Caesar sitting it. Yeah, white yeah, fella. Yeah, yeah. Arthur. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember Arthur? Yes, of course. He was he was a lot to me, mate. Mm. He was a lot to me. Cause I used to see him going to school, come back from school. He so, taught me a lot and so, so told me a lot. The, these men in our community who took their time to mold and shape us and give little kids like us time. Yeah. They were our father figures in the community. Our uncles, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. Now I'm saying that people knew what they were doing when they were bringing the most addictive types of narcotics into the lower working class areas to infiltrate and stunt any growth economically or otherwise that yeah. we may have had and to cause, because to cause the, um, risk. because me and you both grew up in a generation pre and post the crack epidemic mm. so some people only knew about rolling a spliff and, and bunning a little weed and like we said we all had unity and we had care for the kids mm. and i know a time where parents would go out of their way to do what they could, commit crime if they had to, beg, steal and borrow if they had to, just to provide that shiny red bike for the kid at Christmas. Mm. Um, then we went through a generation where the parents would probably like steal that red bike off the child and go take that and smoke that for Christmas. So these children Sad. grew up in a time where dysfunctional parenting through our community being plagued with drugs with an agenda, um, mashing up the households, these kids have had to grow up ruthless. If we think, oh yeah, we know nitties and they're ruthless, yeah? Like, what about- <laughs> You said ruthless, I thought you meant with a house with no roof, but no, 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 no yeah, they're, they're ruthless. Yeah. They, they'll no, yeah, do, they'll yeah. do whatever it takes what to- What are the kids now? No, so I'm saying, if the parents were ruthless yeah. because they were nitties, yeah. The children had to grow up with that. Yeah. So the children are ruthless without any influence of drugs. Mm. They're just being made to be set that way within their environment and mm. how it's raising them. So if we're looking at our younger generation as a generation of the kids that are being grown up on the back of our generation being destroyed with addiction, mm. as well as poor education, as well as poverty, as well as unemployment, and now the devastation what drugs has brought to our community. Those children have been raised on the back of the destruction of our generation. Mm. So our generation weren't in a strong place to so, be strong for ourselves, let yeah. alone the next generation after us. So the next generation after us have got all of my compassion and my understanding and my respect for making it through without our guidance that they that they should have had that they deserved yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. what do you think he's done 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 for them though that 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 ruthless nurse and the disparity of not respecting uh not not having a reason to respect the elders no one's telling them nothing well what do you think that's done on, on on a collective for everybody well, well what i'm seeing at present day is something that was broke down to me by the great Chancellor Williams in the book, Destruction of a Black Civilization. Okay, I don't know the book, but In on. the 80s. Yeah. And um, what I'm seeing today is the with the disparity of the community going through addiction, financial, education, yeah. um, unemployment, the children of that community are growing up. Now, I've always thought, why do we, by force and law, 
have to have our children be schooled in a 12 stop 12 stage brainwash camp by mm. our enemy mm, 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 yeah mm, mm, by our mm, mm, enemy mm, 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 bamboozling them with the roman empire's indoctrination to be a good worker for their systemic machines they don't want you to think Fucking out the preach box. that again, mate. They, no, because people don't, don't know. You know no, when you get in no. trouble when you're trying to go against a teacher in class. Come people on. don't know. They're trying Come to conform on. your shit, Why man. do you think I didn't last past the first year? Ah, me as well. Seven. I got expelled and suspended in every school I went to. Because our spirit told us that we're wrong. Now we're elderly. We can articulate it properly. As kids, ah. we felt frustrated at the lie that yeah. we knew didn't ah. sit with us as a truth. Whether it was history, geography, religious education. Yeah. Oh, man. So, what we've got today is we've got... Dysfunctional families bringing children into the world, mm. right? Nobody's to blame apart from the higher agenda that wish for us to be in this position because they're the ones who are the benefactors yeah, from, from keeping us suppressed and oppressed. Mm. Um, so what we have today is we have a generation of children being babysat and indoctrinated by the Roman Empire's indoctrination to be good robots, to work as good slaves mm. for their societies. But, but go on. Then what we have is at home, people used to be babysat by the television. And I'd say our generation, many, many children of our generation when we was children, had the television as babysitters. Yeah. But what the children have got today to babysit them is Grand Theft Auto, mm. where... Or YouTube. Or YouTube, which we're not monitoring. Yeah. And with a game like Grand Theft Auto, the ultimate objective to this game, which is the biggest selling game in history and generated more money than anything ever in history. But where's the conscious responsibility? Bro, do you know? Because it, the aim of the game <laughs> is, is for children to sit at home and play this game. And it's doing um, criminal activities that they're rewarded used, by. No way. I used to play that game. I took my glasses off. I used to play that game. 10 years ago, maybe. I played it so much that certain times when I was on road, what went through my head was, let me just drag this person at the car, swear to God, or let me slap this person off the bike. You're in a Grand Theft Auto situation. Yeah, but it's so crazy how the stuff can go into your brain, though. It's mad. Like, I'm not not that... So our children children are being indoctrinated at the schools. They're being brainwashed by these computer games. They're being influenced by these computer games that to aspire to do criminal activities i mean i am gonna say this right now that if we want to look at how here in britain we glamorize and almost idolize criminal activity we only have to look at buckingham palace and the 70 year crime reign that elizabeth regina had and if we want to know where the biggest um, <laughs> stolen warehouse in the world is, it's surely the British Museum with the benign bronzes that are dear to your home. Um, you know, like so. Oh, it's we, fucking bullshit, though. So, oh, no, wait, no, 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 but I'm saying we no, know, we, we know who the criminals are. Like, yeah. so don't tell us in society that you have to be good and you have to be right and you have to do things according to the book and play by the rules. Yeah. When everything that you lot have attained, you attained it through. Murder, pillaging, and war. But I don't, I don't understand. This is what I'm going to say. Al. I don't understand how, after everything's come out, that the British, the Spanish, the French, they keep, they keep all this fucking shit. That like, it doesn't make any sense to me. I saw there was, they got, they were going to give back some Roman, some Roman sculptures, some Greek sculptures. That diamond that was in the, that they the wanted African to diamond, from my man. No, they, they, what, they, the one that they teeth from that's Africa. They goes, they teeth it from a fucking. Ten-year-old Maharaja. Yes. Oh, the peacock in the eye. Yeah. yeah. Mahara- t- yeah. And they, they the said, like, I stole eye. it from a ten-year-old. Yeah. The fucking East India Dock, whatever. Yeah, the- East Indian Railway Company. Yeah, yeah. What the mm-hmm. fuck? And they, and it's the. I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, it's time. Then they can just, they're just getting away with it, and no one gives a shit. Or ta- you can't do nothing about it. I don't ta- get it, mate. It's time that not only do we get it, they should get it. <laughs> I'm not inciting but- anything, please. No. It's time for the uprise of a revolution. Let's just be clear here, right? Do you know what, though, Al? Sorry, because I'd be letting you talk because I want to cut you in. Cause, like, it's coming <laughs> because of all what's going on now. Like, it's coming, like, in the next two, three years. The, the, all the, everything is just building up to that, bro. Let me say this. Go on. From an educated point of view, for those who don't know at home, uh, and I might be preaching to the converted who know all too well. Preach, my man! If Africa was to close its doors next week, the world would be in problems. Mm -hmm. And that's just a week of Africa refusing to trade 
with exterior people. Mm. Now, if we take it back and we look at what they devised as the scramble for Africa. What's going on now, you mean? No, no, no. What's no. been going on a couple of years back? It was the scramble for Africa. Franz Ferdinand organised it in Geneva, where all of the European continents came together in a meeting of how they would carve up the wealth of Africa for the European continent. Fuckers. Fuckers. So they went in and they had already worked out who was going to get what and who was going to get where, where the cocoa was, where the gold was, where the minerals were, where the wealth was, which European continent is going to get this. People don't know that because some people of the European Council in the Scramble for Africa, in the Geneva Committee, didn't get a fair deal. This is what sparked the First and the Second World War. Yeah? Yes. Europeans being jealous that they didn't get a big enough cut than their other European counterparts. And these are the reasons for the First and the Second World War. Fucking hell. Um, so Appreciate with the scramble... Give me, for, the, give me the information, so, I'll give so, it to so me, mate. With the scramble for Africa, what we know is at the beginning of the European invasion of Africa and the birth of colonialism, we saw the same families, Leopold, who is the same family as Prince Charles is today, same bloodline, same family, okay. um, go into Africa for the rubber tree plant. Today, it's the same families in there for the cobalt that we make our mobile phones from. There's been 400 years of economical leeching from mm. the Europeans on the continent of Africa, not to mention the free labor of the slave trade for 400 years. Mm. If we look at what world economics is and how world economics was attained, mm. world economics for what it is and how it was attained was through the pillaging of Africa. Mm. So when we was to try contemplate what something like reparations for Africans would mean, it means giving back all the wealth in the world back to Africa because that's where all the wealth in the world comes from. So when we speak about the idealism, that, when we speak about the idealism of reparations, yeah. are these European and Western societies willing to actually entertain the idea of reparations, meaning that it gives everything back to Africa, leaving nothing for themselves, because in actuality, all they ever had was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I like the and, and Africa, no, but and if they Africa, can't give back, and Africa had everything. So let's look at if they the, can't the, give the economics back today. The, the statues it, it, in this. How are they going to no, give no, no. So, 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 so in twenty twenty two, we still have so many African nations that money goes into the French banks that they're not allowed. African continents still pay in the trillions mm. every year to their European colonializers. To this day, it's mm. still going on. Um, like, it's an outrage. It's the world's biggest crime in history that's still taking place here today. Mm. The, the silence on African slavery is a travesty. What do you mean? Um, economical slavery being held um, at ransom by the West's economical infrastructures, mm. when in actuality, the West economical infrastructure was built on the labor of Africans. Mm. It's, so, so when we talk I about- I was talking to someone the other day and he goes, it's illegal to export, um, you know, like crude oil or whatever, mm -hmm. unrefined from a certain country, but you can come to Africa and do it as, as freely as you want. There's another country, I think it's illegal, I don't know, it's Russia or something, but well, it's what, actually illegal to, to take it out unrefined. Well, so what, in the watch country. this, in Europe, it's illegal to grow organic food because you have to what use- What the fuck is going on? You have to use pesticide control f as a European standard, which stops it from being organic because yeah. if you're using pesticide control on your vegetables, they're not organic anymore. Yeah. So even organic vegetables is maybe a myth unless you've grown them yourself in your clean soil and put no <laughs> pesticides on it and you can stay organic. Maybe a myth, organic. it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a myth. Yeah. So if, let's 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 get back to it is Black History Black Month. History Month. I don't like that. I don't like it neither. No, mate. I don't like that. I don't sit right with me, mate. No, it's Not fucking to bollocks, isn't jog it? it on, innit? Fuck off. So what we're gonna say uh, and the reason it sits uncomfortable with us is because we come to find out that 
African Americans celebrate Black History Month in February. And we're seeing the notion again of divide and segregate in the celebrations when it should be a synchronized unification around the world. I always like to state the point whenever October runs round that um, are we excited for November Black Future Month? And I have to say it to Black manifest it for yeah. it to materialize. I don't care who gets the credit for it, uh, but Black Future Month November. If we're going to have October as Black History Month, Black Future Month should be November. I think one of the first parts of Black History Month. I, I mean, the, the whole fucking year should be should be it should be the whole fucking year. This should well, be a month. It should well, be just this is the way we live. And this is what we're doing. I think one of the first lessons in the West about Black History Month it should be where white people come from. <laughs> where? <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't that be the first lesson in Black History Month? Where white yeah. people come from? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many I, things. I believe in educated. the West. I believe when when teaching white children in the West, yeah. Black History Month, it should begin with where white people come from. Yeah, yeah, but that's just me. I think all the fucking lies should be told the truth. All the lies. That, that's what I think should come out. Well, you where the like... white people come from? Why does Black History Month um, start four hundred years ago and not predate that? Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Come on. The stuff that we've got going on, like when they find them statues in the river and all that, tell yeah. the story about what people have done yeah. and emulate the people that need to be emulated yeah. properly. Yeah, you Speak of all of these roads. Come on. Cecil Rhodes. Rap. Rap. Um, rap around the world. I don't know much time. Uh, someone told me off about this. Rap around the world and then you've got artists. I know you've got a camp and you've got artists with, around you, haven't you? Yes. You're helping people as well. Yes. Yeah, I need to know about that stuff before we go as well. So we've got, we've got, I'm not saying how much time we've got, but let's talk about rap around the world. What do you think about the Spanish rappers, the African rappers, the French, what's, what, if you all, the, the evolution of that, what, what's your take on that? My take on that is that people will become liberated through expression, whether it's art, dance, poetry, music, or film. And to see people from economical disadvantaged places all around the world finding their voice of expression through rap i applaud it it's mm, the most beautiful mm, thing i could see mm. but that's whether they're doing it through rap through dance through art through film expression has always been suppressed mm. if you wanted to bring out a ballet before it had to be approved by the royal academy of ballet at the, you the, the club. <laughs> if you wanted to do science, it had to be the Royal Academy of Science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you wanted to do music, it had to be the London Philharmonic. You know, it had to, yeah. everything was so. So even back in the it's day, as well, you had to go so to even, fucking science school. Even yeah. back in the day, nursery rhymes were political revolutionary songs. For oh, fuck's sake! Yeah, her tissue, her tissue, we all fall down. Yeah. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were all talking about political agendas yeah break it down as nursery rhymes can you um, break it talk, down yeah talking about the plague a tissue a tissue we all fall yeah, down yeah, yeah. ring of full of roses a pocket full of posies uh, and they were talking about what politically was going on the great fire of London stuff like this wow. now today if we can do that through rap <laughs> through song through music <laughs> through expression poor people around the world are expressing their truth I'm hearing rap music from indigenous Canadians yeah uh the most beautiful music but then now I'm being educated to the plight of what the Canadian indigenous woman has been suffering which is which is that they've been pulling them all into camps and making sure that none of them can have babies and they For take they, fuck's sake, they man. take pride in their pride Let's yeah yeah the, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. pride yeah now when we have a family do we call that our pride is a lion's family called his pride. Yeah. So let's think about what a pride call, is. Pride and joy, innit? We call it. A, a pride is family. And they take pride in their pride. And they've been having an agenda to make sure that all of the native women from Canada, the indigenous Aboriginal native women of Canada, yeah. uh, being... N neutered or... New, like, like, yeah. Sterilised. Like, Sterilised is the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> so, you know, if I didn't know about world rap, I wouldn't have heard native aboriginal canadian rap and if i wasn't hearing native aboriginal canadian rap the plight of the native aboriginal woman wouldn't have been brought to my attention yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot there's so much stuff going. That's, why, like, that's why i like living in a bubble yeah like, I, I know mean, i want to help mean, people but i so, don't want to be fucking some, traumatized. Some, some great palestinian rap coming out um we've all seen a little kid on the gaza strip 
rapping his truth. And how old is he? He's like 11, 12. Yeah. And he's rapping. What's the, what you see that? What, I can see that, yeah? Yeah, it comes up as a thread. It's on YouTube, you know. So we're seeing little kids from the Gaza Strip rapping about what their truth is. Yeah. You know, Palestinians rapping about what their truth is. Yeah. I've always, I always have that analogy, you know. Like, no matter how bad it's got over here, it's not Gaza, not certain places where you're you're ducking bullets and that kind of stuff. And people are still living in them places and living, living. Do you know I mean, we're complaining about shit here. It's a lot, man. That's part of the agenda to keep us well behaved. What do you mean? If, if we look at lower class, middle class and higher class, the higher class allowed the middle class to let the lower class know that they need to aspire to higher class to do well. They're also letting the middle class know that if you don't do well, you'll be back down there with the lower class. <laughs> yeah. So at the same time, we're like, oh, we've got it bad here, but they've got it worse there. What is that to make us feel comfortable about how bad we've got it? Shouldn't all humans have it beautiful on planet Earth in the yeah. year 222? Yeah, 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 definitely. Shouldn't all of the children just be living yeah, in harmony? Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about children from Palestine rapping because their house is getting bombed. Mm. And they're using this rap as their expression to hope prevent their family from being killed by missiles that are made by the British government. <laughs> so, so whilst we're here talking about the 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 war in Ukraine, I'm gonna rap right out. So we've got the the war in Ukraine, and they have their own Russian political agenda for whether they were or weren't going to join with NATO because Putin had asked them not to. When we speak about the royal family and the same people who cut down the rubber tree, um, their homeland is Ukraine, and that's where they come from. The royal family of the Windsor Castle's homeland is Ukraine. Um, Prince Charles is a direct descendant to uh, um, Count Vladimir Dracula. <laughs> Fuck off. Yes, he is, and he owns the um, rights to the castle. Yeah. Um, you say you put in my chain? No, 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 not at all. So you're saying Prince Charles is a vampire? Not a vampire, but he's the I'm descendant saying, of, of I'm Dracula. I'm saying everybody in the royal family is a vampire. <laughs> and I'm not laughing, I'm not stuck. No, I know you're not vampires. laughing. I'm laughing at your, 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 your sternness I, when you're saying it. When Some I was, of the things you said on this show, Al. When I was I'm young, not cutting off of that as well. When Fuck I was young, you I used know. to think that they were talking about draining the labour of the poor people. Babylon system is the vampire. Until I found out that they drink adrenochrome blood. So they are in actuality vampires and the practice has gone on for a long time. What's adrenochrome blood? Um, just before you die, there's a great little chemical reserved in your brain that will give you the best experience that you've ever known as you've died. It will be released from your cerebellum, a certain liquid that will make you feel heavenly. That's why some Just people, before you die? Yeah, as you're dying. Your best buzz you know is reserved that? for you. Because some people talk about the tunnel of lights and that's the liquid gets and then they come back to life. It, it, these are scientific facts, what I'm talking about. Um, if you are dying because you're being killed in fear, then your adrenaline will be right up. So if you're about to die f and your fear of your death, like me and you are coming towards the crash in the wall in the car at a high speed and we can see our certain death is coming towards uh, us and we're crashing to that wall, uh, our adrenaline will pump into our blood and some people have been extracting this adrenaline-filled blood to use as a drug. So just that they, 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 they get that situation to happen and then they, they take their blood out of them? Yes. Now, um, by the time we've reached our adulthood, many a times we've been scared. But never has our adrenaline pumped in our blood like the first time we were scared. So they use young children for this. Fucking who been no, scared before man. so they can get the best... Man. So they can be most scared and get that pure scaredness. Because the children don't know scared. Me and you know scared. So they drink adrenochrome and practice this. And they have been for centuries old. They are actual vampires. Like David Icke ain't mad. Um, Who's David Icke? He's an ex-footballer who became a TV pundit. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you say he ain't mad? Because he speaks of the same thing and they try to condemn him as crazy for speaking oh, the truth. Okay. For exposing these things. Conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Um, so, where was we just at now? We're talking about all these families run things. <laughs> they, they, their homeland is Ukraine. Yeah. In Russia, do you know what they did to the royal family? No, kill them. Yeah. 
They took them all into the basement and shot them to death. In France, do you know what they did to the royal family? Huh? They chopped off their heads. Oh no, that's a revolution though. The French Revolution. Was that something else? So where's our British Revolution? Where is our British Revolution? Where is it? Look at what they've done to the royal family in every other continent, but here we're mourning them. We're mourning these criminals. Uh, we're mourning these fascist oppressors. The so brain, let me. The so brain, so the here, here's the point good, I'm bringing. Bro. The brainwash was good. So, bro. so let me get to this. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> the gonna man, remix it, yeah. The, the man's got game like a moth. The, the, the man's got game like a mother father, right? But, <laughs> Don't say it properly. Yeah, yeah, so, so it, it is. I'm going to remix it. You know, especially if we're drawing towards final points and closure, right? So now, <laughs> boom, boom now. <laughs> Go now! Because like you said, I don't fucking like that. I don't fucking like, like, don't that, fucking no, like fucking that. that no. So boom now, here's what we're saying. <laughs> At the moment in Ukraine, there's a, a war with the Russians. And all throughout the time that there's been a war in Ukraine with the Russians, there's been war in Ethiopia, there's been war in Somalia, mm. there's been war in Palestine, mm. and there's been war in Yemen. But every other more place that I've mentioned after Ukraine, it's UK bombs that are made in the UK that are dropping on these territories. Mm. And now if we have all these children of war, why are we holding a specific place for the children of the Ukrainian war. Mm. Why can't we house the Somalian children from war for 350 a week in our mm. house, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm gonna go on further to that. Why can't we house a homeless person from the UK in our house for 350 a week? Mm. Because we can't house a Palestinian or a Yemen or a Somalian yeah. or an Ethiopian or anywhere else that British bombs are dropping on, but we can house a Ukrainian child for 350 a week. So now, but we can't house, fucked, but it? we can't house a homeless child for three fifty a week who lives in the UK, the UK on the yeah, streets yeah, of England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, if we say that in war we have numbers of casualties, and people can escape war because we signed the Treaty of the Geneva Peace Treaty Convention that if you are seeking asylum from war, you can come to England, mm. and we will give you asylum. Mm. Now, what I wish the question is. When the war between Wood Green and Tottenham have more casualties than the Ukraine war, when can we declare the war in Tottenham and Wood Green a war? If the casualties are higher. Yeah. But the casualties ain't higher, are they? Yes. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. I don't even want to go to the numbers. I know about all that. So, so let's just wanna... say the youth numbers yeah. of children's lives being at loss in Stamp, Wood Green yeah. and Tottenham, Tottenham is yeah. higher than in the Ukraine by tenfold. Yeah. So why haven't we declared that a war? It's fucking sad, man. Can we take children from Wood Green and Tottenham and say, we wish to save these children from the war? And who's going to asylum seek them then? Like, can, mm. you, can you be from the war in Wood Green and Tottenham and seek asylum in Birmingham? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Ukraine. Yeah. Nah. Oh, oh, Ukraine, yeah. yeah. You know, but, but like, like what I'm saying... There's, there's families that will be in Cornwall and Devon and um, Kew Garden and some really well-to-do areas mm -hmm. that will be thinking about housing a child from the war to Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah, 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 yeah. But they wouldn't, con they wouldn't contemplate for a million years housing a child from the war torn North London streets. Fucking hell. So we can oh, we, we can we, we can seek asylum <laughs> for, ch for children from outside the country. Yeah. But we can't offer asylum for the children within our communities. Yeah, it's a lot. I ain't got nothing to say to you, mate. It's fucking I a lot. Just, it's I a just lot. thought I'd raise those. No, it's points. a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, no, it it's really a is a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm fucking feeling that, mate. No, Leave I don't it fucking out. like that at all, mate. <laughs> don't like that, mate. Wait, what, 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 what? Apart from what we're doing right now, <clears throat> what can we do? What can we do? Yeah, apart from what we're doing, because this today, this show is going to help some people, I guarantee We it. can make sure that there's um, comments and forums and that people who may be able to comment can leave links in the descriptions that we can all learn from because we're at each one teach one. We have to help each other in this day and age mm. come to the position that we need to be. Yeah. You know, so it's all about each one teaching one. It's all about learning from each other. Um, for me... Incognitive dissidence plays a big role. Incogn incognitive incognitive dis dissidence. Dissidence. Now, now, what it is for me is if someone is being told that white Jesus is going to come from the sky and save them and have preached that their whole life, to now come along and get them to accept the idea that there might not even be a white Jesus. What? Jesus ain't white. No, but they're saying, well, is there a Jesus? Yeah, I knew that's uh, what? I knew that's right? So, 
Is there a letter J? Is there a le <laughs> the letter J is only 500 years old. Yeah, no, I know a lot of things. It's not, it's not what it's supposed to be. I'm just checking. So I'm, what I'm saying, go on, I'm listening to you. Some people have incognitive dissidence because they're, they're being conditioned so brilliantly for so long with so much lies that trying to accept that what they've been promoting all their life is a lie. They have a problem trying to accept that. Mm. You know, like, how can we take the old West Indian granny who's like, Lord Jesus, we better get to the church and give them all of our money so that white Jesus can save us into the pearly gate. Yo, granny, you're being conned. Yeah. And she's like, being conned what? That's the devil playing a trick on you because that's what she's being taught. You know, so like, how do we fight against people's incognitive dissidence is our hardest battle. One thing that I will say in closing, um, I'll ask a question to you, Io. Do you recall the first time that you ever would have been aware in history of them using means of genetical warfare? Do I know when they used genetic warfare? First. Uh, I would have I would have said it was uh, Hiroshima. Most people think the atomic bomb, the nuclear bomb. Yeah. I think back to when the white pilgrims gave the native Indians smallpox infested within the blankets that they gave them as gifts, knowing that the Indians... I've never had no immune system Immunity to it. to it, and it would be no harm to them. So this was silent weapons for silent wars. Um, so we know that, that when they wiped out the Indians, it was in the means of giving them a blanket as a gift. Mm. We know that when they put the Jewish in the Zeitklein gas chambers, mm. they were inviting them to take a shower. Today, they're inviting us to take a vaccination. Mm. Like, as if I haven't seen this being played out before time after time after time. The government can't dictate to us what's best for our health, but they're making us feel like we're responsible for the health of everybody else by not taking this vaccine that's in actuality a poison. So I'm seeing this Pfizer vaccine rollout the same as I'm seeing it when it was Jews going into the gas chamber. I'm seeing it the same as when the Indians were dying from the smallpox. And I'm seeing how many people are dying and being hurt and being wounded from this bogus injection that's mm. being forced upon them. And then I look at people's incognitive dissidence. It said on the telly that you've got to take it for the better without questioning. Um, I know that most people out here that I know in society, if you go to ask them about the new smartphone that they're buying, they're going to tell you how many megapixel the camera's got, how much data it's got, how much memory it's got, on what um, setting it's working on, on what pixel that you're watching the YouTube, and they'll know everything about that phone. You go ask them about the new car that they're buying, and they'll probably tell you what insurance group it is, air safety bags, good tires, oil mm. checks, <laughs> all of them thing there, window wiper indicator, and they're going to know that they need to know that they're going to be in a safe car. Yeah. And now you're going to inject something in your arm and you're not even going to take the same checks that you would with your mobile phone or your car. It's their incognitive dissidence of what's being told that they're acting like sheep following the flock of the, mm. of the agenda. You know, so like I say, in part of this global awakening for human beings to come into their true sovereignty and achieve harmonious peace on earth, for all to attain, mm. yeah? We first have to unindoctrinate ourselves and don't let incognitive dissidents get in the way of three thinking outside of the box. If, if we, if we, if we, if we, I can't, if, like, I haven't spoken much on this interview, right? Because I've been soaking so much up, Al. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, mate. And, and all any of us will ever know in our lifetime will only ever be a teaspoon full of an ocean of knowledge. <laughs> I don't fucking like that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's just how it is. I, I, life talks. Life talks. <laughs> yes. Skinny man. Yes. My brother. Come on, my bro. You, every time. It's really emotional for it me. Is. <laughs> do you know that we could do this every week and speak about satin girls and go on for a hundred years because I'll, 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 we've, got, we've got that much ground to cover. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get back in, you know. should we say leave your comments, leave um, helpful descriptions and links, yeah. and let us gel off that, and we'll be back at you for another live talks. Sweet.
on the turn of the new year? Yeah, no, yeah. see, before that, maybe. Before that. Maybe before, before that. that. Before that. Before that. Before that. Before that. Come on, love. Love, come on. Ah, wizard! <laughs> yeah, we got the wizard. <laughs>